Welcome to Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein, your host. And each month we like to feature a Naval Postgraduate School research project or research professor. Uh, this month we have Dr. Nita Shattuck from our Human Systems Integration Lab. Nita, welcome to, uh, to the show. Thank you. Thank and you for having me. And thank you very much for uh, educating our future officers in the U.S. Navy. We're going to talk a lot about the uh, Human Systems Integration Lab and your specific area of research, but I'd like to start off with learning a little bit more about you. How did you come to the Naval Postgraduate School? How did you come to Monterey? So I arrived here um, uh, after uh, doing a lot of different research with the Navy, also working with the Air Force, but I, I had a position here at the Naval Postgraduate School um, teaching human factors in the Operations Research Department. So that's kind of how I ended up here. Um, and it, it just by chance uh, that, that I, I'm here, but I, I really um, I loved uh, hearing my father's stories about the Navy. So it was kind of a, it was a wonderful. Your father was in the Navy. My dad was in the Navy. He was actually at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. Oh my goodness, so, was he on a ship or? No, he was a corpsman. He was a Navy corpsman and then he was attached to the Marine Corps. Uh, for the next uh, five and a half years. Oh, so, he must have seen all yeah. kinds of action then yeah. across the Pacific. Yeah, but you know, I, I always remember the stories he told me about uh, his, his buddies in the Navy. And so that was really, has always been uh, uh, a, something that I've remembered. And it was a real honor to be able to work to try to help naval officers, help the Navy sailors. In, a, in effect, and that's what I've been able to do. Well, great. Well, we're going to get to that. Or no, are you from California originally? No, originally from Texas. Originally from Texas. I grew up there. I did my PhD there, University of Texas. And what, what did you do your doctorate in? In behavioral science. Oh, so, that's dangerous. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I was always interested. Uh, I go off to the library. I was supposed to be uh, reading about cognitive development and these kinds of things, and I'd come back with with things about Navy divers and and uh, and their cognitive performance in cold environments, cold water, and things like that. So I kind of had there was this interest about these unique environments that the military exposes people to. So. so, but was your dissertation in this area, or no? It was actually on children on the effects of skipping breakfast on learning. Wow! So that was my professor's. Uh, that was my major professor's interest, and and I would come back, as I said, with all these articles about <laughs> Navy divers. <laughs> Navy divers. In cold water. Like, what does this have to do? <laughs> you're with not. You're not miss, You're missing That's the right. point. I was like, I know. And then, but then from there, I was able to. I started working for the Air Force. I had a postdoctoral fellowship and with the Air did, Force in Texas. Or? In Texas okay. at Brooks Air Force Base. Sure. With a human centrifuge. So I was doing. G induced loss. So again, kind you got of, to twirl people around. I is did that right? Take them for a whirl, for a spin. <laughs> oh, so cool. we were looking at, um, at again these dangerous environments that the military exposes people to. Right. They have to. Uh, so so we were looking. So I did my early work was in G induced loss of consciousness. You mean at what point do people pass out when you twirl exactly. them around? Exactly. Is it all the same, or is it different based no, on people? No, there's. So actually, you can you can calculate it by looking at the distance between your heart and your eye. Is that so right? So if you're a short short person with high blood pressure, maybe you know think about a smoker, a little fat cannonball. Yeah. That's the best uh, G tolerance that you could have. That so. explains a lot of fighter pilots <laughs> in the 50s and 60s. There you go. Right. Exactly before they had all this protective stuff. But well, yeah, I was able to to be involved in that, and then from there, uh, I've you know I had a long career working in in aviation, and so I was in worked in uh, navy naval aviation down at Point Magoo, and then came from there up here to teach at. Uh, well, did, did, did your centrifuge force actually help design flight suits in order to counter yes. G-forces? I mean, yes. that's the purpose of doing yes, that, right? Yes, we tested them. Well, you also, uh, just like in an altitude chamber right. with pilots, they demonstrate what happens when they're hypoxic. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. Uh, they demonstrate to them that, hey, look, this, this aircraft can outperform you and uh, you will lose consciousness. And, and many of them, when they get this training, but it also, uh, they, they do a straining maneuver that helps them at G-tolerance, 
helps them improve their G-tolerance. So, so that straining maneuver is something they practice on the centrifuge much safer than practicing it in flight. So you just said that you, you came to Naval Postgraduate School and you taught human factors inside the operations That's research right. department. That's right. Now, and, and you just described one of the important reasons why we teach human factors, uh, to understand that effect in, in uh, heavy environments. What, so the, that is also part, or the, that's the educational side of the Human Systems Integration Lab. That's right. So before we get into your most recent studies on, on sleep and watch rotation, which I really want to get to, <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the HISL and the different research areas that the HISL has done, or the Human Systems Integration Lab. So um, the HSI lab is really designed to give students um, practical exercises so they can do things like I can, I can look at my reaction time, I can say, okay, so how do I measure human performance? Oh, I look at speed and accuracy are two major uh, criteria for looking at performance, measuring performance. So what we do um, with the work that we do in the HSI lab is we have a lot of really cool games, fun things, demonstration. It's not, uh, it's not all fun, but basically it's a way for, for students to very practically approach the material so that they learn it, but then they're able to apply it in their real life situation. So, uh, you think about like reaction time. So I'm going to have to. I'm monitoring something for uh, to watch for an occurrence. Uh, something's going to happen, uh, and and I've got to watch for this. It doesn't happen very often, but so, so are sailors looking at a scope, for example, exactly. a radar scope. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a vigilance task. So we teach them about that, um, and so we have a lot of equipment there that actually uh, shows them uh, how we how we actually test these. Things. We also have equipment that actually looks at stature. We we have all the anthropometric devices that mm -hmm. we use to 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 say, okay, can you eject safely out of this cockpit? Will you fit into this armored personnel carrier? Will you be able to egress out of this hatch? And those how to kinds design things. those things exactly. to meet the majority of people. And so what we try to do um, in human systems integration is rather than uh, having a, a, a system that's fielded and then we go, oh no, this doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> or, or everybody hates it. Yeah. We try to do this, this and we advocate for doing this at the various er very earliest stages of an acquisition. So whatever kinds of things that, that are being produced, we say, okay, we have an idea that we need this new capability. Let's think about how the human is going to be engaged with this, whether an operator, a maintainer, or a trainer. Sure. Um, how, how can we make it easier? And if you think about it from the outset, it's much more cost effective than waiting until, oh, now we've got to, to change things around, we've got to train around this problem, those kinds of things. Or get shorter, taller sailors, or what? Exactly, <laughs> and I mean, you know, NASA has the, uh, NASA is able to, to you know, basically put a call out and really select people. Yeah. Although the two astronauts that I know at NPS, one's really tall and one's really short. <laughs> sure. so, so they still meet it somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um, I, there's other t t areas that I want to talk to you about on research if we have time. Okay. Uh, one of those is the research you've done in accidents investigations associated with humans. You can't get particulars on that, but you've looked at ship groundings, that sort of things with students. Uh, the other is not really your field, but one of your colleagues did motion sickness uh, oh, and the impact and design of motion sickness C, which is very critical. But uh, with our time, I want to focus now on uh, what you have had, I would have to say, that of all the faculty members of the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, from an, a very informal and unscientific sample, you have had more headlines in your work <laughs> than anybody else. There's been those of us who've been on magazines, there's been the published in the Wall Street Journal, but you have got the Navy Times headlines <laughs> record on the research you've done for sleep and watch cycle. So tell us a little bit about that, and with that, we've got some toys here you're gonna show us. So first tell us about the research program and what the purpose okay. is. So, um, when I first started teaching at NPS, I had students that they told me they were SWOs at the time. I didn't Surface know line what, officers. I, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what a SWO was at the time. And then I found out these are, yeah, they're surface warfare they're officers. officers so, yeah. so they said, ma'am, we're not getting any sleep. It's very hard to stay awake and all this. And I thought, well, how is that possible? They're, they've just got to be really whiner, whiny 
whiny people. They're, they're, <laughs> but I can attest fact, they're not whiny people. <laughs> I know. Or their schedules, their sleep schedules right. are really messed up. Right. And in fact, um, in, in the last 16 years since I've been at NPS, I found that they, they are, in fact, very messed up. The, the schedule, so when we think about a normal human day, we're on a 24-hour day. Mm -hmm. So you wake up That's about the same time. That's convenient because the earth rotates That's then. right, about the <laughs> same. So, so, um, so, and our cycles are set by, primarily by sunlight, mm -hmm. is how they're driven, that our circadian rhythm. But the Navy, in its infinite wisdom, decided that they would have submariners. They're not on a... On, uh, they don't get exposed to sunlight, so let's put them on an 18-hour day. That's the equivalent of six hours of jet lag every day for the submarine community. Oh my. But the surface warfare community, not to be outdone, decided we'll put our people on a 15-hour day. So we have this amazingly uh, difficult uh, schedule called a five and dime that you probably have experienced in your life. Five lifetime. and dime is a watch rotation. A watch so the, rotation. The, the, you know, you have, right. We have to explain a little bit that we do these things because someone has to be on watch somewhere on the ship at all times. That's right, 24, 24 hours. hours a day. That's right. So if you do that, so depending upon how manning, when you have, do you have adequate manning to, uh, and they have to be qualified watch standards, they have to know how to do whatever it is. So when you look at, at all the challenges of doing this, what, what the Navy came up with was this idea of, okay, you'll stand watch for five hours, then you'll be off watch, often doing your other jobs, work, that's day right. jobs, uh, for 10 hours, then right. you'll come back on for five hours, off for 10 hours, and this just cycles. So what that equates to is a 15-hour day, so nine hours of jet lag, better than, <laughs> we're gonna, we'll do better, better than, than the, the submarines. submarines. Nine hours of jet lag, so I'm sleeping uh, every, every day. I'm sleeping at a different time of the day or night. So we as humans want to go to bed at the same time and awaken at the same time. That's healthy sleep habits. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, once I started exploring this, lo and behold, the, the surface warfare community was was spot on. They are not getting. They're very tired, but it's primarily self-inflicted. So because they had adopted these schedules and because this is tradition now. Right. After a certain, I don't know how many years it takes for, for the Navy for something to be a tradition, but this is tradition now. So, so uh, we would go out and uh, to yeah, ships. Hold that up. Let's see that one. Yeah. There we Here. go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's one of these. This is a, a really expensive Fitbit, like a $1,500 Fitbit is wow. basically the equivalent. So this one actually, it collects your sleep data. It's called an actigraph. Mm -hmm. So you can wear this. We actually had this on a commanding officer of uh, a destroyer who wore it for six months. So we looked at his sleep pattern over a six-month period. Uh, on average, he got about five hours of sleep over that entire time. And we could actually see when Benghazi occurred in his sleep pattern because he, he didn't get much sleep he right after Benghazi. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is another sleep device, another one that we have. This one has the added advantage. In addition to doing actigraphy, it can also collect data. It's got a little game well, wait, on what's it. What's actigraphy? Actigraphy that is your your sleep data. Oh, your sleep so data. When you sleep, when yeah, you're when active. You're, yeah, yeah, so okay. act, uh, actigraphy is, um, is just a way of looking at the motion that you right, have. Right. So during the day, as you're walking around, you have activity that's recorded on this device. It's just a little accelerometer, um, and so it records it. So this one has, in addition to doing sleep, this one also collects, can, you can collect uh, performance data on it. So we have a three-minute game that you can play, a reaction time game. It's right. really, we're collecting, it's a validated measure. Based to collect. on how much or less sleep you have, how exactly. fast you are in reactions. Exactly. Sure. And so what we've been able to do is we take this out to the ships and have sailors wear this. We get, we've actually been able to now determine What's the average reaction time of somebody on a five and dime schedule versus somebody who's on a different schedule? So you so, can compare watch schedules that's and right. watch rotations to see which is the to better see rest. performance. Sure. To actually, because we say, because people say, well, we don't care if they're rested. Well, no, but you care about their reaction times. Right. Right? So they actually have used this to come up with blood al alcohol equivalents to say, if you're awake for so many hours, 
your performance is equivalent to someone who is legally drunk. So without for, the fun, without the fun, I've been there. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we only have about three minutes, uh, but I I want to put these on. Okay. And as I do, I'm going to show the audience here. What do these do? Okay. So. I told Can you I that keep them on for a please while? keep okay, them on. Right. Okay. So <laughs> as I told you, uh, one of the really important what we call a zeitgeber, the thing that tells us the when it's zeitgeber. more zeitgeber. You make this stuff up. Oh, no. <laughs> so zeitgebers tell us when it's morning and when it's time to go to bed. Right. So it sets our circadian rhythm, and that's primarily through the use of blue light. This so is right these, there. Yeah. yeah. So these actually are blue light enhancers. They give you blue light. So if I'm having to work at night and I want to be alert, I want to adjust my circadian rhythm. Oh, you can rhythms. see the blue lights in my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It reflects blue light off the retina is alerting. So we can actually reset your circadian rhythms. We can mess you up by having you wear these for an extended period of time during the day. They actually alerts you when you're uh, wearing these student, them. My students need to wear they these. They do. <laughs> And then the other, the other uh, end of that spectrum are these, these blue blockers. So I can either so give I'm sorry, you... So I'm sorry, what does the blue light do again? The it blue light will, will, uh, it will alert you and it will reset your circadian oh, rhythm. okay, got it. So if you're going to have to change to a new watch bill and, you know, maybe it's a six-hour change or maybe I'm traveling to another country and I want to adjust to that country's time zone, I can use this to help me get adjusted. Got it. So okay, they can actually, and, and if you're in extreme, extreme uh, latitudes where it's long days or long nights, you can use a combination of these. There you are, very, very styling there. Dr. Klein, I can understand. Klein. I can understand where you can't get <laughs> sailors to get these off. <laughs> they want to ride their motorcycles That's with right. them too. Yeah. So, so we put these on for two hours prior to bedtime. And this and helps these, you sleep. This helps you. So your your melatonin levels, which is your sleep hormone, naturally occurring sleep hormone, melatonin rises when you're uh, at night. Uh, in, in dim light and so you want to have that before you go to bed so if you wear these two hours prior to bedtime even if you're working nights getting off early in the morning if you put these on these will help you get to bed if you're trying to sleep during the day. Now, are these available locally for people if they have trouble sleeping? Um, well, not from you, but I mean from doctors. Yes, I'm sure that they are. These I actually got from the Naval Ophthalmic Group in Yorktown, and we just did a big study with Marine Corps Embassy security guards around the world with these, and very, uh, uh, they really seem to like them a lot. Well, we only have about uh, a half minute left, so let me kind of summarize okay. Uh, some of the great work that you've done. You've uh, helped the Navy adjust uh, many ships watch schedules to be, have more alert uh, sailors with the ability to react faster. You've uh, helped the Marine Corps across the globe in their security efforts uh, on our embassies. And so let me thank you again for your great work and we'll look forward for that next newspaper headline that you have. <laughs> okay. And thank you for joining the Your Town television program. This is Jeff Klein, your host from NPS. We look forward to seeing you again when we feature some more research from Naval Postgraduate School.